Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, a Kwanzaa story, Maulana Karenga. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Kwanzaa. December is fast approaching, and thus this trio of greetings seems appropriate, although some may feel that something was out of place in the list. The proportion of African Americans who celebrate the distinctively African American holiday, Kwanzaa, has always been relatively small. Whether a Jewish family is religiously observant or not, it is a safe bet that they'll know what you mean when you wish them a happy Hanukkah. With Kwanzaa, you can't be quite so sure. Adding to the uncertainty, what counts as celebrating the holiday is itself a vague matter, making it difficult to arrive at a credible estimate of how many celebrate it. But no one has ever convincingly suggested that a majority of Black Americans recognize and embrace the holiday as their own. For the minority that do, though, it is deeply meaningful. And as Keith Mays points out in his book, Kwanzaa, Black Power and the Making of the African American Holiday Tradition, there are celebrants outside of the United States to be counted as well in places like London, Paris, Toronto, and in the Caribbean. Indeed, Chike grew up celebrating the holiday with his family in Toronto. And why not? Well, reasons have been offered against the celebration of Kwanzaa, among which the worst is that this is a made-up holiday. As a moment's reflection will reveal, all holidays are made up. Unlike Santa Claus, they don't just descend from the heavens, they are the creation of humans. If someone refused to drink a green beer with you on St. Patrick's Day on the grounds that the whole event is as artificial as the color of the beer, then you'd rightfully pay them no mind. You'd go ahead and drink without them, letting them turn green with envy instead. Like the story of St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland, Kwanzaa has an origin story that Chike learned as a child, a story that naturally rendered the holiday's creator larger than life. The major event that inspired its creation, according to this story, was the riot in Watts, also widely known as the Watts Rebellion or the Watts Uprising. This violent eruption in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Watts took place in August of 1965. We first mentioned it in our episode on the last years of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., noting its apparently deep impact on King's thought. At least as the young Chike understood the story, there was a man living in Los Angeles named Maulana Karenga, who was saddened by the destruction in Watts, but who hoped also to channel the spirit of rebellion in a more positive direction. So he made up a holiday intended to unite and empower African Americans through a celebration of their African heritage. He researched the traditional harvest celebrations of indigenous Africans and sought to create an African American holiday that could play a similar role. For the timing of the holiday, he chose the seven days directly after Christmas. He assigned to each of these seven days a principle to cherish and discuss while ritualistically lighting the candles that form part of the Kwanzaa display. He gave the principles, the elements of the display, and all other aspects of the festivity Swahili names, thus Kwanzaa was born. In this episode of the podcast, we will investigate the man and the mind behind this celebration. This follows naturally from our discussion of the Black Panthers. Kwanzaa was invented in 1966, the same year that the Black Panther Party was founded, also in California. Nor is this a mere matter of overlap in time and location. The conflict in the late 1960s between Karenga's US organization and the Panthers, especially their Los Angeles chapter, has had remarkably long-lasting effects. Consider this critical description of Kwanzaa by the conservative pundit Ann Coulter. Kwanzaa was invented in 1966 amidst the madness of the multicultural 60s by a black radical stooge of the FBI, Ron Karenga, also known as Dr. Malana Karenga. Karenga was a founder of United Slaves, a violent nationalist rival to the Black Panthers and a dupe of the FBI. Note Coulter's repetitive insistence on Karenga's involvement with the FBI. She goes on, in the column we're quoting here, to claim that Karenga's organization should be recognized as the more violent and hateful group of 1960s Black nationalists, not the Panthers. It might shock, even disappoint, the Panthers of the 1960s, to know that they would eventually be defended as the relative good guys of the era by a white conservative commentator. It is nevertheless a testament to both the intellectual influence of the Panthers and the destructive interference of the FBI during the Black Power era that so many critics of Kwanzaa today condemn Karenga through a lens drawn from the Panthers of that time 
one which identifies him primarily as an agent of the FBI. This is in addition to the false claim that U.S. US was an acronym for United Slaves, a common misconception that takes a panther slur for the organization to be its true name. Actually, though, it doesn't stand for anything. While US is written in capital letters and could be taken as an ironic allusion to the United States, it is really just the word US. Accordingly, our aim in this episode will be to avoid both a childlike positive bias towards Karenga as the inventor of a cherished tradition, and the kind of negative bias that stems originally from the conflict between his organization and the Panthers. Karenga was born Ronald McKinley Everett in 1941 in a rural part of Maryland. After graduating from high school, he moved to Los Angeles, where some of his siblings were already living. Having always been a bright student, he gained an associate's degree from Los Angeles Community College and then went to UCLA, where he attained bachelor's and master's degrees in political science. This period of higher education shaped him in a number of ways. Perhaps most importantly, he developed a passion for knowledge of Africa, nurtured early on by a course on African history that he took at the community college. He went on eventually to specialize in African studies as part of his master's degree. Of course, this passion for all things African has various dimensions, but perhaps the most significant in shaping the general course of Africana life and thought is the interest Karenga took in African languages. It is no exaggeration to say that his embrace of the Swahili language in particular did much to give it a special status among African languages in the eyes of people in the African diaspora. Karenga first began teaching himself the language while at the community college, and then received a language scholarship to study it at UCLA. In his eyes, Swahili was an ideal choice for the purpose of diasporic people connecting linguistically with Africa, precisely because it is so pan-African. It is not closely associated with any ethnicity and allows communication in an African language across an enormous geographical span, particularly in the eastern and central parts of the continent. Karenga would later explain its importance in this way, We don't know what tribe we came from, so we chose an African language that is non-tribal, which is widely spoken in Africa. He would go on to call his philosophy as a whole kawaida, meaning custom or tradition. Karenga's experience pursuing higher education also prepared him in various ways for the leadership role he assumed in the late 1960s. At the community college, he became the first black president of the student body. Looking back, Karenga reflected, Whites outnumbered us then, so it was something for me to organize not only Africans, who were my natural constituency, but also third world people in general, and international students in particular, and even some progressive whites. This was before any talk of multiculturalism. This description of his achievement brings to mind Chicago Panther Fred Hampton's notion of a rainbow coalition, but that's rather ironic because interracial coalition building was not going to be a priority of Karenga's as the Black Power movement came into being. More formative during this time, then, were his encounters with existing leaders like Malcolm X, who gave a lecture on UCLA's campus in 1962 in which he made the following claim about the crisis of cultural identity afflicting African Americans. The American Negro is a Frankenstein, a monster who has been stripped of his culture and doesn't even know his name. It can be no accident that it was during the following year that the man previously known as Ron Everett first started making appearances using the name Ron Karenga. This choice also reveals the strong influence of the Kenyan thinker and leader Jomo Kenyatta, whose classic book Facing Mount Kenya was first published in 1938. We have mentioned it before as an influence on Lorraine Hansberry. Facing Mount Kenya was a pioneering text of cultural anthropology, particularly because it was written not by a European anthropologist, but by an African belonging to the ethnic group it studies, namely the Gikuyu people of central Kenya. Kenyatta discusses what he calls Karenga schools in a chapter on rites of passage that focuses above all on the controversial practice of female circumcision. Missionaries sent by the Church of Scotland opposed this tradition and at first tried to discourage it by restricting entry to their schools, allowing only children whose parents denounced the tradition. This was unsustainable, but even after opening the doors of the schools to all children, teaching in the schools was restricted to those who opposed the custom. Kenyatta writes, The cry for schools was raised, and the result was the foundation of Gikuyu independent schools and Karenga schools. These schools are entirely free from missionary influence, both in educational and religious matters. In the glossary included at the end of Facing Mount Kenya, Kenyatta defines a Karenga as a 
pure-blooded Gikuyu, a nationalist. The choice to take on the last name Karenga is fascinating when placed in this original context. He obviously could not consider himself to be in any sense a pure-blooded Gikuyu, yet he clearly embraced the spirit of African cultural independence implied by the term nationalist in the glossary, and also the history of schooling freed from European control that Kenyatta describes. It is also symbolic of the difficult and divisive controversies surrounding gender in Karenga's movement and in Black cultural nationalist thought and activity more generally that the topic of female circumcision turns out to have been key to the growth of the independent schools in question. Coming back now to the influence of Malcolm X as role model, Karenga has said that Malcolm sought to persuade him to join the Nation of Islam, but he refused. The problem was not that Karenga remained attached to the Baptist Christian faith of his youth, but rather that, having already given that up, he had become wary of ever committing himself to an organized religion again. Then too, most central to his rejection of Christianity was the goal of rooting himself culturally in Africa. This caused him to challenge Malcolm on the question of whether Islam is really any better suited to that task. He has recounted this in an interview. So we talked and I raised questions about the Arab stamp on Islam as an ethnocentric project which had moral implications. So the question was always, where is Africa? The other role model worth highlighting is a man who was, at the time of his influence on Karenga, named Donald Warden. The recurring theme of name changes is presumably familiar enough by now that you will not find it surprising to learn that he later became Khaled Abdullah Tariq al-Mansur. Under any name, he is a little-known but surprisingly influential figure in the history of Africana thought. While a law student at UC Berkeley, Warden founded, along with others, an organization called the Afro-American Association. It was a reading group that gradually shifted towards off-campus activism and at educating and politicizing people from all walks of life in the Black community of California's Bay Area. Huey P. Newton participated and grew intellectually through Warden's influence, and at the very rally at which Newton first met Bobby Seale, Warden spoke and left a deep impression. Seale ended up staying in the Afro-American Association for some time after Newton left it. It's remarkable that Warden influenced both the Panthers and Karenga, who traveled to the Bay Area to participate in events put on by the Afro-American Association, and became the leader of its Los Angeles chapter. Newton and Seal emphasized their break with Warden in their autobiographical works because, while he taught them much, he also promoted an approach to Black nationalism that they came to see as hopeless and counter-revolutionary, the idea of Black capitalism, with Black entrepreneurship understood as central to the community's salvation. Karenga, too, quit the organization by 1965, apparently feeling that Warden was losing his radicalism. This opened the way, of course, for Karenga to create his own organization. Like Warden's Afro-American Association, Karenga's US organization evolved out of a study group, this one called the Circle of Seven. It transformed itself into an official organization in September of 1966, and thus really did arise in the wake of the uprising in Watts, which had taken place less than a month before. Karenga was inspired to leave school rather than continuing toward a PhD at UCLA. One of the initial co-founders of the group, Hakim Jamal, had been a close associate of Malcolm X, even before Malcolm joined the Nation of Islam. He later claimed to have been the one to come up with us as a name for the organization, as well as the motto, anywhere we are, us is. Jamal soon came to disagree with Karenga over the organization's focus on African traditions. Jamal wanted a group that would focus on highlighting and carrying on Malcolm's legacy, but found that this group became a vehicle for the expression of Karenga's ideas. To be fair, though, one of those ideas was marking both Malcolm's birth and his assassination with holidays. Karenga called the celebration of Malcolm's birth Kuzaliwa, the Swahili word for day of birth, and called the day marking his martyrdom Dabihu, meaning sacrifice. As this shows, Kwanzaa was just one of a series of special occasions that Karenga sought to implement in the lives of those who would follow him. There was also Uhuru Day, Uhuru means freedom, marking the anniversary of the uprising in Watts. Let us come now, though, to the most famous of his holiday creations, which is one of the more intentionally philosophical holidays of the world. The name of the holiday, Kwanzaa, itself exemplifies the creative freedom Karenga felt in inventing this new tradition. He took the name from the Swahili phrase Matunda ya Kwanzaa, meaning first fruits, like the first fruits of a harvest. Reducing the phrase to Kwanzaa, he then altered the spelling of the word, putting an extra A at the end. Doubled vowels are not uncommon in Swahili, 
but this added letter serves no grammatical function, so it's plausible to say that Kwanzaa, the name of the holiday with its three A's, is no Swahili word at all. Why then did Karenga add it? As he has explained, the circumstances of the earliest celebration in 1966 inspired his linguistic flexibility. At the very beginning of Us, seven children in the organization wanted to put on a program in which each of them represented and explained a letter. Since Kwanzaa first has only six letters, we added an extra A to make it seven, thus creating Kwanzaa. Maybe we should be grateful that there were only seven children to accommodate. We've mentioned how misguided it is to criticize the holiday for being made up, but the most plausible version of the criticism would be to see it as targeting aspects like this, a made-up word passing itself off as Swahili. On the other hand, given that Karenga has been entirely upfront about the linguistic creativity involved here, who's passing anything off as something it's not? People unfamiliar with Kwanzaa, including many African Americans, often come to the holiday with the misconception that it is a pre-colonial African tradition. And Karenga did take inspiration from real African traditions, especially a first fruits harvest festival practiced by the Zulu. He never claimed, however, that this was an authentic recreation, the standard that critics seem to expect the holiday to satisfy. Kwanzaa is an originally diasporic celebration that makes use of Swahili in its efforts to connect the diaspora to the continent. This issue of authenticity and identity is itself a philosophical one, and it's one that has come up before in Africa in a thought about holidays. As we saw, Frederick Douglass argued that the 4th of July was not an event with which African Americans could identify, the second episode in a row in which we've had occasion to remember this speech of his. But in the case of Kwanzaa, philosophy is baked in like the sweet potatoes and the pie that might be served at dessert during its celebration. Kwanzaa needed to be seven letters long, just as there are seven components of the traditional Kwanzaa display, one of which is the set of seven candles that are lit over the holiday's seven days. This numerical continuity draws attention to the Nguzo Zaba, these seven principles at the heart of the holiday. They are Umoja, which means unity, Kuji Chagulia, which means self-determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujama, cooperative economics, Nia, purpose, Kumba, creativity, and Imani, or faith. Each day is dedicated to one of these principles, and one is encouraged to discuss them with one's family and community members. Thus, the holiday directly encourages in-depth consideration of ethical and socio-political matters. Chike, being a philosopher, is glad for having grown up celebrating this holiday that calls for daily philosophical reflection. But he also grew up loving and celebrating Christmas. This brings us to the controversial question of how the celebration of Kwanzaa relates to religiosity. By the time Chike was introduced to it, it was an important selling point of Kwanzaa that it was a secular holiday that should not be seen as being at odds with the celebration of religious holidays like Christmas. This should not be taken as evidence of the holiday's original design, though. Indeed, important to its initial formulation was Karenga's experience of being visited on Christmas Day of 1965 by Sam Damu, a member of US, who thoughtfully brought a black doll as a gift for Karenga's youngest daughter. Karenga was touched and thanked Damu for the gift, but also let him know, I'm sorry, Damu, but we don't celebrate Christmas. Damu replied, what do we celebrate then? When Kwanzaa was launched the following year, Karenga had his answer. We can get more of a sense of how the US organization at the time of Kwanzaa's creation viewed Christianity by consulting the quotable Karenga. This was a little green book published by the organization itself in 1967 and used to promote its ideas in a format similar to the Little Red Book of Mao, which the Black Panther Party famously sold to university students in order to raise funds. The quotable Karenga was edited not by Karenga himself, but by organization members Clyde Halisi and James Ntume, the latter of whom went on to become a popular jazz and R&B musician. The book opens with a striking testimonial from an anonymous member of the organization entitled Introduction to Maulana Ron Karenga by one of his followers. This is a fine time to note that Karenga had, by this point, taken on the title Maulana, which he translates as Master Teacher. He would eventually drop Ron altogether. The introduction identifies Karenga as the third of a trio of liberators who should be appreciated by all those fortunate enough to live during his time. The introduction's author bemoans not having been alive for Garvey and having been too late in awakening from the Negro state of mind to appreciate Malcolm. The only thing to do, he concludes, is to find the man who will go down in history as the black man of my time 
and give my allegiance to him. The author does not hesitate to affirm that in Karenga, that man has been found. Following the introduction, the quotable Karenga is divided into thematic sections, and a gold star goes to those who correctly guess that there are seven of them. The section on religion consists almost entirely of criticisms of Christianity, including some harsh words for Jesus. It is not just a matter of lobbing critiques, though, as the section also offers a constructive definition of what it is to be God, namely that God is he who moves in power and force, allowing the term to cease applying primarily to a supernatural being. Karenga thus says, we are God ourselves. Therefore, it is not good to be atheistic or agnostic. To be an atheist is to deny our existence, and to be an agnostic is to doubt it. Another way that he applies the term God to humans brings up the troublesome issue of gender. Each man is the God of his own house. No one, including Karenga at the present time, would deny that there are parts of the quotable Karenga that are extremely sexist. We read, for instance, in a section called House Rules, we say male supremacy is based on three things, tradition, acceptance, and reason. We will come back to the question of how Karenga's views on gender evolved after 1967. The first three sections of the quotable Karenga, titled Black Cultural Nationalism, Revolution, and Politics, are rich ground for anyone seeking to understand the real philosophical issue underlying the conflict between the organization Us and the Panthers, the question of the role of culture in the struggle for Black freedom. Newton described cultural nationalism as a kind of reactionary nationalism, in the sense of being the opposite of revolutionary nationalism, which is what the Panthers claim to represent. For Newton, cultural nationalism was guilty of assuming the African culture is enough to bring political freedom. Against this, he argued that only the overthrow of capitalism and an end to the exploitation it entails can bring true freedom to black people. The slur that the Panthers use for this position, pork chop nationalism, likely derives from this pithy saying attributed to Bobby Seale, dashikis don't free nobody and pork chops don't oppress nobody. That comment most clearly targeted the Nation of Islam's restriction against eating pork, which was quite distinct from the African-centered cultural nationalism of the US organization, but the point was plenty clear. Yet contrary to what the Panther critique would seem to suggest, Karenga too argued for struggling to get rid of capitalism. The important difference is that he rooted his call for socialism in appreciation of traditional African communalism, rejecting Marxist-Leninist perspectives like those adopted by the Panthers. As Scott Brown has argued, we should see two African thinkers and leaders as especially influential upon him, given their attempts to devise distinctively African forms of socialism. The first is someone we covered already, Leopold Senghor. The other is Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, the subject of an upcoming episode. It is Nyerere's version of African socialism that inspired the fourth principle of Kwanzaa, Ujamaa, or cooperative economics. Once we get clear on Karenga's rejection of capitalism, noting both its similarity to the Panthers' goal and its different basis, we can pinpoint his objection to their view. According to Karenga, you must have a cultural revolution before the violent revolution. The cultural revolution gives identity, purpose, and direction. Another way he makes the point is this. You can't have a revolution without culture, because culture is the value system that will teach blacks an appreciation for revolution. Karenga thus prioritizes a cultural shift on the grounds that true freedom requires not only socioeconomic change, but a psychological means for Black people to break the mental shackles imposed by an anti-Black racist society. This philosophical debate between Karenga's US organization and the Panthers remains relevant today as the significance of cultural identity in the fight against racism remains a matter of dispute. Speaking of dispute, we must now briefly leave the realm of thought to recount the tragic story of real-life violence that resulted from the rivalry between the groups, as well as the interference of the FBI. One factor often cited is the involvement of individuals from both sides in Los Angeles street gangs. Apparently, the conflict between the Panthers and members of US sometimes involved old gang conflicts arising anew. There can be no downplaying, though, the huge factor of FBI-inspired rancor. We know the FBI engaged in letter writing intended to stoke paranoia and resentment on both sides, which might then break out into violence. Things turned bad on UCLA's campus, where there were competing Panther and US interests within the Black Student Union with respect to the selection of a director for a Black Studies program. After a meeting on January 17, 1969, a physical conflict broke out, turning into a shootout that left two Panthers dead, El Prentice Bunchy Carter and John Huggins. The exact details remain unclear, but 
There is eyewitness testimony suggesting that US members pulled out guns to defend themselves after a Panther brandished his own weapon. Nevertheless, it became the official Panther view of the matter that this was a planned killing of Panthers by government agents. There is, however, no reason to believe the oft-repeated claim that Karenga worked for the FBI. Recalling Ann Coulter's use of the word dupe, we can of course say that both groups were at times tricked by the FBI. Karenga was far from unique in this respect, at least. Scott Brown's book, Fighting for Us, Maulana Karenga, The Us Organization and Black Cultural Nationalism, shows how little evidence there is to substantiate the Panthers' portrayal of Karenga. It should be said, however, that Karenga has expressed displeasure with how Brown treats the events of 1971, when Karenga was convicted of assault and false imprisonment. This was for having allegedly ordered and participated in the torture of two female US members, who he is said to have believed were trying to poison him. Karenga has called Brown's account an unbalanced, biased, and indictment-focused presentation of the evidence in the historical record and in the state's trumped-up charge against me. We're not in a position to weigh the evidence for and against Karenga's protestation of innocence, which has been consistent from the time of his trial until now, and thus we pass no judgment on the matter. It's impossible to avoid mentioning it, though, as Karenga's time in prison from 1971 to 1975 is key to the decline in size and importance of the US organization. It continues to exist to this day, but in a much more limited form. It must also be mentioned because of the change it caused in Karenga's trajectory, turning him from primarily an activist to primarily a scholar. As you might guess, this has implications for his significance within the history of philosophy. We have placed him in the context of the Black Power Movement, which inspired him to leave academia and become the leader of an organization whose members put together a collection of his sayings. Yet, the Karenga who emerged from prison obtained not one but two PhDs, one in political science and another in social ethics, a program in the School of Religion at the University of Southern California. The lengthy and erudite dissertation that gained him that second doctorate is one that we have, in fact, already mentioned all the way back in episode four of the podcast, Mat, the Moral Ideal in Ancient Egypt. It stands out as one of the most ambitious and insightful attempts to read ancient Egyptian literature as philosophy. Related to this dimension of his work is his involvement in helping to found the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, or ASCAC. Let's close by mentioning three other texts that show how philosophically engaged Karenga has been during the scholarly phase of his career, which is still ongoing. As we record this, he is a professor in the Africana Studies Department of Cal State Long Beach. Back in 1982, he published one of his first major texts, his Introduction to Black Studies. Having been a vocal participant in discussions of what Black studies could and should be in the late 1960s, when they first began to appear, he now took on the task of writing a comprehensive textbook for the field. He chose to divide Black studies into a number of subject areas. You'll never guess how many, yes, seven, Black history, Black religion, Black social organization, Black politics, Black economics, Black creative production, and Black psychology. He argues in the book's final chapter that Black studies requires a self-consciousness organization and demarcation of the intellectual enterprise, which only a philosophy of Black studies can provide. Such a philosophy must be an open textured one, allowing for and encouraging diversity of perspective while insisting on basic standards of integrity and rigor for the discipline. Back in the late 1960s, Kwanzaa was celebrated mainly by the US organization in Los Angeles and certain groups in other cities inspired by Karenga's ideas. It managed to survive and grow over the course of the 1970s and 1980s, despite the decline of US and other organizations that promoted it. By the 1990s, it had finally become well known with all the good, bad, and questionable that comes with that, such as big corporations commercializing it. A 1993 article in the New York Times told of the Kwanzaa Holiday Expo held at a Ben & Jerry's store in Harlem at which you could get sweet potato ice cream. The article quotes a representative of Pepsi-Cola candidly remarking, if Kwanzaa is what one of your target markets is involved in, it's what you need to be involved in. In this context, one of the ways its inventor, Karenga, continued to mold the holiday as it became bigger was his 1997 book, Kwanzaa, A Celebration of Family, Community, and Culture. By this time, as noted before, he had moved to a new stance on the holiday's relation to religion. Kwanzaa is a cultural choice, as distinct from a religious one. To celebrate Kwanzaa thus need not be connected to any rejection of Christianity. It's important, however, that Karenga does not treat the point as relevant only to Christians. Thus, Africans of all faiths can and do celebrate Kwanzaa, i.e. Muslims, Christians, Black Hebrews, 
Jews, Buddhists, Baha'i, and Hindus, as well as those who follow the ancient traditions of Mat, Yoruba, Ashanti, Dogon, etc. For what Kwanzaa offers is not an alternative to their religion or faith, but a common ground of African culture, which they all share and cherish. Karenga, in this way, not only treats Kwanzaa as non-religious rather than anti-Christian, but also as a unifying force that can cut across religious difference and reduce its significance. For a final example of his scholarship, we might mention his collection of verses from the Ifa divination tradition of the Yoruba people. He titled the collection Odu Ifa, the Ethical Teachings, thus emphasizing that he sought to translate verses that were noteworthy for their focus on ethical matters. Alongside the translations, Karinga includes occasional commentary, which reveals, among other things, his remarkable mixing of sources, as he regularly relates ideas coming out of this Yoruba tradition to those he found in the ancient Egyptian tradition. In other cases, his points of comparison are recent figures in the history of Africana philosophy, as when he relates a verse about the need to respect the female Orisha, Oshun, to Anna Julia Cooper's claim that there is a female as well as male side to truth. As this might indicate, as compared with the sexism of his thought in the 1960s, Karenga has at least moved toward regularly invoking Cooper and other black female thinkers. There are continuities with his older ideas, though. Cooper's quotation can serve as an example of what he called, even in the quotable Karenga, complementarity. There, it stood opposed to the idea of gender equality, which he called the devil's concept. Given his emphasis in later writings on the equal value of women and men, one can ask whether complementarity, shorn of its opposition to equality, still remains a meaningful concept. As this shows, Karenga's thought has continued to raise challenging philosophical questions, and his career as a whole exemplifies the prospects and challenges for doing philosophy in a pan-Africanist world. In this episode, we touched on the element of creativity, or in Swahili, kumba, in Karenga's most famous contribution, the holiday of Kwanzaa. The cultural nationalism he championed and the ideas of the Black Power movement as a whole made themselves felt in other kinds of creativity too, not least in such creative arts as literature and theater. This will be our topic next time, as we take our cue from Karenga's own declaration that the real function of art is to make revolution. Could racial oppression really be fought using poems, paintbrushes, and experimental theater under inspiration from such figures as John Coltrane and James Brown? We'll find out next time when we will not be on holiday, but doing our best to earn the title of the hardest working men in podcasting as we turn to the Black Arts Movement here on the History of Africana Philosophy. (laughs) 